really excited to be here. Thank you so much, um, Katie, for letting me come back and do this. Um, of course, I am very interested in artificial intelligence. As I told you, I was a UX designer for the past eight years, and that mostly meant that I designed apps and things like that. I was a uh, design manager at Vivint Smart Home, and uh, I was responsible for helping design a lot of the features of the product that relied on artificial intelligence. <coughs> and um, I've given kind of uh, uh, presentations to larger audiences about the usability issues of AI, but mostly in terms of automation, um, but also conversational interfaces like chatbots and voice interfaces, kind of like Siri and Alexa and those sorts of things. <coughs> so um, anyway, let me just start off with uh, kind of a basic definition of AI, the one that we can kind of use to work with as part of this presentation. And uh, the first definition is any man-made machine that can think and or act like a human being. And this is mostly relevant in the context of philosophy or um, science fiction. Uh, the second definition is that AI is really just a marketing buzzword for new computer technology. Um, AI, you know, it was what we used to call a lot of computer software and computer products, uh, you know, 30 years ago. But once those computer projects became boring and well understood, um, we ceased to call them AI anymore. And this has happened many times. And in, in 10 years from now, the things that we're calling AI today, we're not going to call them AI anymore because it's only a term that we use for the latest and greatest kind of computer software breakthroughs and things like that. Um, so anyway, that's just a definition to work with. So this presentation I'm going to go through, i um, going to present three different philosophical positions. I'm going to talk through five distinctions and some vocabulary to kind of help you kind of think um, about these issues and, and maybe you know, use this vocabulary to analyze these issues. And then I'll go through two arguments. So the first three philosophical positions relate to the relationship between computers machines and consciousness. So position one. First position is that brains cause consciousness. The brain is literally a computer and one day we will be able to create consciousness uh, on a computer. Okay, this is position one. This is held by philosophers such as Daniel Dennett and David Chalmers, for example. Position two is that brains cause consciousness. Okay. The brain is a machine, but it is not a computer. Um, it is logically possible that we could create an artificial consciousness on a machine, but the computer is not the type of machine that could ever be conscious by nature of what a computer is. This is held by John Searle, who you read, as well as Roger Penrose, theoretical mathematician, who's written a lot about this. Position three is that consciousness cannot be created artificially in any sense. And this is for a, very, a number of reasons, um, one of which is because either it's not part of the physical world or it cannot be explained me me um, mechanistically or, or computationally. I would think that uh, Descartes would probably be sympathetic to this view, um, and as well as Plato. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just to summarize those three positions. So yeah, position one is, you know, is could we make a conscious machine? Yes. Could we do it on a computer? Yes. This position is is functionalism, basically. Uh, position two says, yes, we could create an artificial consciousness on a machine, but a computer is not enough of a machine to create consciousness, so that would be no. And then position three is you can never make it either on a machine or a computer. Okay. Uh, one more caveat about this position two. This yes here, what they really mean is that, yes, we could create artificial consciousness on a machine, um, in terms of it, it's, a, it's a logical possibility, it may turn out that it's empirically impossible for some reason or another, but at least it's a logical possibility. That's what they mean there. Uh, I'm just going to punt on the third one. I'm just going to punt on that one for now. It just happens to be the case that that is a minority view in philosophy uh, of mind, and there are a lot of respectable people that, that would hold that view, but it, it, it isn't where most of the discussion is happening, and um, I'm just going to punt on it and examine position one and two for now. Okay? All right. So those were the three philosophical positions. Any questions about those positions? Okay. So five distinctions. So I'm going to go through simulation versus emulation, weak 
AI versus strong AI, syntax and semantics, observer relativity versus observer independence, and then the distinction between computers and machines. And these uh, distinctions will be used to uh, build on the arguments uh, at the end. So you can imagine two machines that look human and act human, but one is conscious and one is not. The one that is not conscious would be uh, a Cartesian zombie or an automata, okay? Um, <coughs> you could say that the one that is not conscious is just a simulation. So that's what this word means. It's the word that, that John Searle uses as well, the simulation. Simulation just means it's an imitation. It's just pretending, right? Emulation, in, in this sense, I'm using the term to mean uh, something that is uh, causally equivalent, right? So it's functionally equivalent. It, it, it would be a machine that is conscious and it duplicates all the right processes in order to be conscious. So even these two robots may act the same and look the same, uh, they're very different. When we talk about AI, we often use the term artificial uh, ambiguously. So one, one definition of artificial is uh, that it's not real, just an imitation, kind of like this beautiful imitation butter right here. And um, <coughs> another sense in which you use artificial is to talk about things that are actually real, but they're just not produced by natural means. So artificial diamonds are real diamonds in terms of their um, you know, composition and, and, and whatnot, but they're just not produced by natural means. So a simulation AI would be one that is not real intelligence, just a simulation. Emulation AI is um, one that is, uh, is really intelligence. It's, it's, it's the real deal, but it's not produced by natural means. Okay? So sometimes those, those differences can, can muddle the conversation. Uh, so I like to, to make those um, distinctions clear. The third distinction is one between weak AI and strong AI. And these relate to different hypotheses about what computers can do. Okay, weak AI says that a computer could, in theory, simulate any aspect of a human being. What this says is that, you know, in 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, we could have a computer, we could create an automata that wouldn't be conscious, but would be so lifelike and realistic that we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's what weak AI says. Strong AI is called strong AI because it's a strong claim about computers and what they can do. Uh, this one says that computer software plus hardware alone is sufficient to completely emulate the human mind, meaning that computers alone could be conscious. So if we take position one, of course, both of these, uh, Dan, Dan, Dan and David Chalmers do believe in strong AI. They hold that, that hypothesis as true. But position two, you can get some separation. John Searle, for example, thinks you could simulate uh, a, a human being completely with computers, but just not emulate. But Roger Penrose says, actually, there are things that humans can do that you actually couldn't even simulate with a computer. You can simulate a lot, like speech and all these sorts of things, but he gives some very interesting examples of, of chess moves that a computer would never be able to make, for example. It's very interesting. But that's just, uh, that's kind of a side note. The fourth um, distinction is syntax versus semantics. And syntax comes from the Greek meaning ordering. It just relates to the rules and the symbols um, uh, uh, of, our, of our language or just kind of, um, you know, any sort of symbol that, that we're using. So in terms of computers, we're using ones and zeros, for example, as, as the most basic symbols, right? That's what syntax is, symbols and the rules. Uh, semantics is the meaning that we assign to those symbols. So the word semantics is actually used very differently in different departments. It's used differently in linguistics, used differently in computer science. But when I say semantics, I'm talking about meaning. So the symbol is D-O-G, we, we assign meaning of dog to that. Okay, so syntax versus semantics. These uh, two, uh, you know, polysyllabic words, phrases, <laughs> um, observer relative, observer independent, are very important for the second argument that I'll be sharing with you today. Observer relative relates to things that only exist because we think that they exist. These relate to things like money and elections and those sorts of things, right? Money has no meaning or value except in the eye of the beholder. We believe that it is money and therefore it is money. If there was no conscious beings in the universe, it wouldn't make sense to say that any of these things actually existed, okay? Observer independent facts, so these are things that exist regardless of what anyone thinks or believes. Things like atoms and mountains and tectonic plates, those sorts of things, right? 
And so if uh, everyone in the universe disappeared, you know, those things would still exist. Something is only syntax based on the way we treat it, right? Syntax is observer relative, and what that means is that something counts as a symbol only if we believe it is a symbol and count it as a symbol, or at least acknowledge that it is a symbol that we all share and use. Does that make sense? Okay, consciousness itself is observer independent. So I did say earlier that if every, um, if every conscious being disappeared, you know, these things will still exist. Well, the exception is consciousness. Um, consciousness, um, uh, it, it would disappear if every conscious being disappeared by definition. But what I mean to say here is that I know I'm conscious regardless if I even believe that I am or not. Okay, so that's, that's what that means. It's an observer relative fact. I also will use this word intrinsic. Consciousness is, is an intrinsic property. And it means, kind of, it means the same thing. Just one example of this observer relativity versus observer independence distinction is information. So we often say that a book has information in it, like, oh, there's a lot of good information in that book. But that, when we say that, we are using the word information in an observer relative sense. It's only information because we can interpret those symbols in a certain way that gives them meaning, right? But that's very different from when we say, oh, I have information about somebody. I know their phone number, for example. That information would be observer independent information, okay? All right, well, this is the last distinction between computers and machines. So one way to think about computers and machines is that machines is, is, are something that can perform uh, any function, right, or a certain function. Some physical system, right? But computers uh, are a type of a machine. And computers, formally defined, are an implementation of a Turing machine. Um, uh, an example of a machine that is not a computer is something like a heart, right? Or even an artificial heart. It can pump blood, and a computer could simulate the pumping of blood, but it's not going to actually do that. Similarly, you can simulate on a computer a rainstorm, let's say, but it's not going to make you wet. Does that make sense? So all computers are machines under these definitions, but not all machines are computers. This is a Turing machine. So this, this is going into the definition of a computer a little bit more, uh, more thoroughly. So a Turing machine is a, a hypothetical machine uh, invented by Alan Turing. And a Turing machine is not something that you can go buy from the store. It's purely a, a, a thought experiment in a way to, um, to act as a model for computers. Turing machines have a tape head and an infinite tape with symbols on it. And the tape head can move left or right along the tape and read the symbols and write symbols according to a set of rules. So for example, you could get to a position on the tape head, and in that particular state, you could have the rule read a 0, write a 1, and then move right. You taken 252? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Then you could go along the tape and another rule in that state will say, okay, if you read a one, then write a zero and then move right along the tape. Something like that, okay? So in the textbook that we used for the computational theory class, there's a very interesting sentence that helps to describe what, um, um, uh, what Turing machines are and what they can do. So here we read, we now set up a format annotation for describing Turing machines. The input to a Turing machine is always a string. A string is just a collection of symbols. If we want to provide an object other than a string as input, we must first represent that object as a string. Okay? A Turing machine may be programmed to decode the representation so that it could be interpreted in the way that we intend. Okay? So what this means is that computers and computation are defined syntactically. All they can take in is symbols, they can do operations on those symbols, and then they can output symbols. And we can represent numbers in terms of these symbols and have the machine, in this case the computer machine, perform some sort of operations to give us some result that allows us to interpret that result as if it's an answer, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, I'll go a little bit more into that. 
This is, this, I was debating whether to put this in or not. This is maybe, maybe a little bit technical, but the idea of programming is that you have some problem domain that admits of some possible range of answers. And what we do in, in computer science is what we, we want to represent that problem domain in some way and perform some algorithm on that representation that admits of an interpretation that we can then uh, interpret as giving us the answer that we want. Okay, so if this is two plus two equals whatever, that's the question, two plus two equals what? We can represent those twos and ones as these collections of symbols, run an algorithm on it, and it will give us another collection of symbols that we can very easily interpret as being a four. Okay. So what this means is that the computation going on here is actually observer relative. What that means is that it all depends on, on the, the interpretations, representations that we're assigning to what's going on, not anything intrinsic to the computer. Okay. All right, so here's the two arguments. I'm going to give two arguments uh, against position one. Okay. These are uh, both uh, from John Searle. First argument is the one that uh, you read about that has the Chinese room um, uh, thought experiment. First premise is that syntax is not sufficient for semantics. What that means is that the symbols alone are not sufficient to create any sort of semantic meaning or intentionality. Premise two is that computation is defined purely syntactically. As I showed you with the Turing machine, which is a model for all computers, including you know, the one that I'm using right now, uh, the computation that's going on is purely defined in terms of just symbol shuffling. Premise three is that minds have contents. Uh, specifically, they have semantic contents, okay? So the mind has, you know, we could think of the mind as assigning uh, meanings to, to things in the world like, like symbols and things like that. And so the conclusion is that computation is not sufficient to create minds because computation can't get from the syntax to the semantics. So here is a short video that explains the Chinese room thought experiment, which is just an illustration of this argument. 60 Second Adventures in Thought Number 3. The Chinese Room Can a machine ever be truly called intelligent? American philosopher and Rhodes scholar John Searle certainly can. In 1980, he proposed the Chinese Room thought experiment in order to challenge the concept of strong artificial intelligence, and not because of some 80s design fad. He imagines himself in a room with boxes of Chinese characters he can't understand, and a book of instructions which he can. If a Chinese speaker outside the room passes him messages under the door, Searle can follow instructions from the book to select an appropriate response. The person on the other side would think they're chatting with a Chinese speaker, just one who doesn't get out much. But really, it's a confused philosopher. Now, according to Alan Turing, the father of computer science, if a computer program can convince a human they're communicating with another human, then it could be said to think. The Chinese room suggests that, however well you program a computer, it doesn't understand Chinese, it only simulates that knowledge, which isn't really intelligence. But then sometimes humans aren't that intelligent either. Okay. So the Chinese room argument is supposed to be an illustration of, of this argument. Now a lot of people poke you know, holes in the Chinese room thought experiment, but and I think that they have actually been somewhat successful at, um, at uh, uh, showing some of the weaknesses of the thought experiment, but I think what is, more, what is stronger than the thought experiment itself is actually the, the argument. Um, the argument uh, that uh, semantics is, can't come from syntax. Okay, so that's argument one. Argument two um, is, also, is also from Johnson. I think it's much more interesting than the Chinese room argument. And this one starts with the premise that computers are defined syntactically. Okay, they're just a symbol manipulation. Okay, premise two says that syntax is observer relative, it's not intrinsic to the physics. What that means is that whatever operations are going inside of this machine that we call a computer, it, it doesn't even have the syntax, right? It doesn't even have symbols in it except for the symbols that a conscious being standing outside of the computer assigns to the symbols. So, we said earlier that uh, syntax is observer relative, okay? 
So, that I so if computation is defined syntactically, well, computation is only the function that we are assigning to this machine that we're calling a computer. Okay? Computation done on an implementation of a discerning machine is observer relative. It's only relative to our interests and the way that we interpret what's going on. Computation, on the other hand, could be defined observer independently. We could say that I can perform an intrinsic computation right now. Let's say 1 plus 1 equals 2. So I just performed that computation, um, and that was done by me. So you could say that the only computers that are observer independent that exist are conscious beings with minds capable enough to perform the steps of computation. So in that sense, the only thing that are, that are really computers uh, are, are humans, right? Um, but in a observer relative sense, uh, it's just simply that we're assigning those meanings to what the computer does. So in the example of the Chinese room, you could say, oh, if you see this shape, uh, then produce this shape, and the person that's shuffling these symbols doesn't know what those mean, you could think of them as doing this. They have some sort of question, and that question is written in Chinese. I don't actually know if that's a question or not. <laughs> but, uh, but that Chinese is then got, you know, goes through some algorithmic solution um, that has the output right, of the right symbols. Those symbols are then uh, given as some result, and those can be interpreted by the person standing outside of the Chinese room as having meaning. But at this level, there's no actual meaning going on. It's the same thing with computers, except that there's no symbols even in the computers, just s electronic states, right, and different voltages and electronic circuits that then can be used to admit of some interpretation that is useful to us. So therefore, the conclusion is that, that computation is not discovered in physics. Computation is assigned to the physics, right? It's not something intrinsic in nature. And when we want to find out if something can be conscious or not, we want to know if it can be conscious in an observer-independent sense, not just if we can ascribe consciousness to it as if it has consciousness. We want to know, does it really, is it really conscious? OK. So um, one consequence, you, you all know the concept of the multiple realizability? This is the idea that uh, 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 the mind can be um, uh, can exist not just in our, our brain, but in other formats, or it can be realized in other s sorts of systems. Okay. Well, that's the same thing with a computer. You could uh, I showed you what a Turing machine was. This was a theoretical concept of a tape with a tape head. Okay. And this is an implementation of a Turing machine, but it's just realized in a different way. So computers have multiple realizability. You can um, uh, create a computer mechanically or with water pipes and gates and things like that. But computers are more than multiply realizable. They're ultimately universally realizable because anything that we could interpret as a computer could be considered a computer. So this desk here, I could say, oh, this desk is a computer. It just has a really dumb program. Stay there, right? And so we could say that the star in the sky in this position, it has this particular representation and when it gets to this position, we ha has a certain interpretation, right? So we could really treat anything as if it's a computer because a computer is uh, an, an observer relative concept in the sense of, of the uh, Turing machine um, definition of, of computers. So is the brain a digital computer? Remember, this is one of the premises of position one. In one sense, yes, because anything can be assigned to computational interpretation. But in another trivial sense, we'll know, since nothing is intrinsically computational, except conscious beings that are performing the steps of computation. So therefore, it couldn't be discovered that the brain or anything else was intrinsically a digital computer, so the question actually has no clear sense. It's misformed. So the conclusion of argument one is that the semantics is not intrinsic to the syntax. And the conclusion of argument two is that the syntax is not intrinsic even to the physics. So I think that argument two is a much more, much stronger argument against position one. So just some conclusions. Uh, is computer hardware and software sufficient to create consciousness? Uh, or in other words, could we um, upload our minds to a computer? And the answer is no, because consciousness is an intrinsic phenomenon and computation is not. In other words, strong AI, AI is a false hypothesis. How much progress have we made towards developing a truly intelligent thinking machine? 
I want to say that we've made zero progress because we actually don't know how the, all the causal mechanisms of the brain that uh, give rise to consciousness. If we wanted to start to create a machine that was truly intelligent, we wouldn't sit at our terminals and, and you know, start typing. We would try to find out how the brain actually does it, right? And then find some sort of way to duplicate those causal processes. Uh, in my view, you literally have to believe in magic to believe that a computer could be conscious. Um, okay, but is the brain a machine? I think yes, or at least under position two. Um, yes, if you define a machine as a physical system that performs certain functions, then the brain is a machine. Uh, could we build an artificial brain? It's at least a logical possibility, but we couldn't do it with computers as you know, formally defined. So in terms of the three positions, I think that position one has very strong arguments against it that I presented to you. And I, I think that something closer to position two is, uh, is going to be um, more, more persuasive, more convincing given, given the arguments. That's it for my presentation. And these are just some ideas for further discussions and questions. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. And let me know what questions you have. Yes. Elaborate more on the um, simulated chess moves that could be made by a computer. Um, so you're talking about my comments about uh, yes. Roger Penrose and certain chess moves. So yes. he, I don't have uh, that slide here, but he shows certain chess configurations that require understanding of the game of chess in order to make the right move. But since computers don't have an understanding of chess, they're only shuffling the certain symbols around that can be that represent the chess pieces, they actually are unable to make those same moves. And so he gives certain examples where you can you can you know move your queen kind of around all of the pawns and make the right move. Um, but a computer wouldn't be able to to make that because it re it actually requires true understanding of the game of chess in order to make that move. Now someone may argue with me and say, yeah, but what about, you know, the, uh, um, what about the new uh, machine learning techniques that are out that, uh, you know, can, can perform chess? Well, what they are based on is evolutionary algorithms. This is, I, I'm not an expert on this, but they're based on evolutionary algorithms, which, which does have a random element. So after a certain amount of random tries for that particular, those particular positions, they actually may find the right move. But they're not finding the right move because they have an understanding of the game of chess. They're just trying the random moves and then basically saying, okay, this one will give me this result. And so, yeah. So is that kind of similar to the Chinese room thing where you can probably turn out answers but not necessarily understand what really is going on? Right. Okay. Same, same concept. Yeah, same concept just applied to the example of chess, yeah. So I, I'm curious. Um, it seems like, a, according to your arguments, a computer could still almost, without, uh, could almost make us believe that it, that it was human, but we're, we don't call that consciousness simply because it's, it's an imitation rather than a consciousness. Is that what you're saying? So, in theory, a, a complex enough program could be made that it would almost identically simulate human life but we still don't call that consciousness. So I, understand, I just want to yeah. make sure I'm understanding. That's, exact, that's exactly right. So if you could assume a million years from now, <laughs> we have super, super fast computers, but they're still carrying out the steps of you know, the, the, Turing, the Turing machine and whatnot. Um, and they had really, really complex algorithms and really, really huge databases, right? We could imagine it completely fooling us, and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference, which makes for some great sci-fi movies, <laughs> right? But uh, so, so that I'm saying is at least a logical possibility under position two. Now, some people would would reject that. They say there's some things that even a computer couldn't couldn't simulate. But I think that it could get good enough that it could definitely fool us. Um, uh, under either variation of position two. So anyway, yeah, you're, you, that's, that's, that is an understanding of what I was saying. With, as somebody with absolutely no knowledge in that field, how, how close are we to that? Is there, is there anything that's even remotely close to being able to, to simulate that? No, no. 
there, there, there are things, okay, so, so the Turing test is a test that is designed to see if a computer program could trick a person, okay? And there is these competitions every year to see who can, who can um, trick a person. And um, their criteria is 30%. If it can fool 30% of the people, then they say that it has passed the Turing test. Okay? And so the way the Turing test is administered is that someone stands at a computer and types, and then they receive you know, typed output back from that computer. And they don't know. It could be a human on the other side, or it could be a, pers a, a computer. So they, they actually don't know. And so they have to make a judgment, was this a computer or was it a human? And you could just ask it a very simple question like, which is bigger, the nickel or the sun? And no computer can answer that. <laughs> right? Um, and unless someone has specifically thought of that question and programmed that exact answer. Okay? Because the computer, the, 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 they, um, there actually was one, one computer um, program that did full 30% of the uh, participants, but it did so by all using all of these tricks. It said, oh, I'm this kid from Russia, I don't know English that well, and so you would ask it a hard question, it's like, why are you asking me these hard questions I don't even know, right? And that was what the computer was programmed to say, and someone was like, I I'm not sure, but the thing that fooled the person was not really cool computation, it was basically really good puppetry, right? <laughs> That's what fooled the, for, fooled the person. So, um, so yeah, we are, we are so, so far from anything, anything like that. And people, judges of these competitions, they're like, yeah, we are really, really far. But you don't hear that because a lot of people, you know, want to talk sensationally about it and talk, you know, basically market this because AI is a buzzword, right? They want to they wanna say, oh, this is so intelligent, so amazing, whatever. And computers are awesome. I love it. That's why I'm going to computer science. They can do great things. The fact that computers are syntactical machines is, is its strength, not its weakness, right? But the, and for most things, this conversation really doesn't matter. It only matters when you're trying to make some psychological or philosophical kind of um, uh, you know, assumptions about computers and what they can do. That's right. why talking to Siri is so frustrating. Yeah. We want her to be right. <laughs> we want her to know everything. Yeah. Well, let me just, yeah, really quick on Siri. You know, if we have to repeat ourselves to another human being, we get really frustrated very quickly. Or if the other person, you know, uh, doesn't understand. We get, we just naturally are frustrated, but we're also naturally like uh, have this tendency that when our phone talks back to us, our natural like caveman assumptions are that here's a little person inside of this thing that can answer any questions, right? And so, and so what happens is that the, it, that voice interfaces are so limited, but our expectations, just psychologically speaking, are go up so high the first time that we hear it, hear it talk, and so we can become we become really really frustrated when working with voice user interfaces. So the least usable voice user interfaces are the ones that have the most functionality. Because you don't know what it can say, what it can't. The best user interface experiences are the ones that are very limited and you know ahead of time all the, the very limited things you can say. Because then you're not frustrated because you have the right expectations. So that's just something interesting about uh, design and you know uh, voice interfaces. But yeah, yes? Um, I just have a question about the simulation emulation distinction. Yes. Um, I guess it always surprises me when they're both, well, when emulation is understood in terms of functionality, because I have a hard time then understanding how we know it isn't just a really, really competent simulation. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and one word that didn't show up in your presentation was qualia, right? Mm -hmm. um, you did talk about consciousness. Um, but I was wondering if maybe you could speak to it, particularly you know, for the students who are going through this first time. Um, how does qualia work into this discussion? How does distinguishing between simulation and emulation without explicit reference to qualia work? Yeah, so, so uh, in my use of consciousness, qualia is coming along for the ride. Okay, right? so I didn't, so I'm, I'm assuming that we're talking about P consciousness as a necessary aspect of a system that could be said to be fully conscious. And for our visitors, that key consciousness is phenomenal consciousness. So the what it is like aspect of mind. Yeah. So if you wanted a, a definition, let me go through Thank here you. really quick. Um, this, uh, let's see. Okay, so here's a definition of consciousness. So, so we don't have a scientific definition, right? We just don't have a scientific definition of consciousness, consciousness yet. And by scientific definition, I'm distinguishing that 
uh, to a, um, uh, a common sense definition. So before we had a scientific definition of water, for example, we did have a common sense definition of water as a clear, colorless, tasteless liquid, something like that, right? And then we got the scientific, sh scientific definition, which is that it's H2O. It's the same thing with consciousness. We have a common sense definition, which is uh, subjective states of awareness or sentience that begins when one wakes up in the morning, continues throughout the, the day, right, until someone goes to sleep again or is in coma or is un otherwise unconscious, okay? And so uh, it's just those, those, those states of awareness and, and that's enough that we can um, talk about it and make some arguments uh, with it, even though we, we as of yet, lack a, a scientific definition. But yeah. So to, to make the connection, just to clear, you guys probably get this, but um, the lack of semantics in a computational machine or computer is, we're going to imply, at least we don't know, we have no reason to believe there's qualia, right? Um, semantics and meaning is importantly tied to qualitative conscious experience, phenomenal conscious experience. Yes? I have a question. Now, a couple questions. So, follow-up question on that is, we, um, I guess, categorize um, babies or some animals who have, as having consciousness, right? But let's say maybe the semantics or understanding of the seven-year-old um, might be different from that of an adult man mm -hmm. or even a six-year-old or even like a toddler, right? Um, so if such beings or I guess in this context, if such brains are termed to be conscious, how is that different from a computer who could probably think better than a toddler? So the argument is that computers can't think. They can only simulate, right? right. So, so, so ultimately, a computer may give you very complex calculations. In fact, a very simple pocket calculator can, give, <laughs> can provide calculations that are way beyond what anyone, any human being could do. But we still don't think that pocket calculator is conscious, right? So, so even, the ba even a baby, <coughs> even the most... Um, um, you know, m mentally disabled person right. or baby. Right. They, they, even if their their understanding is so so limited, they still have a understanding, right? Or I'm assuming that I'm assuming they do have some some type of understanding, which is more than a computer could ever have okay. by definition, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious. Is like, is there? So kind of this rejection of the first position, does that imply that um, brains are not deterministic? In, or, or that there's something, because I imagine like, could you in theory say a brain is like a really, really complex Turing machine. Once enough of chemicals, you know, hit this receptor, this electron or like, you know, this pulse will go and cause my arm to move or something. So is there, I don't know, I'm just interested about like, what does this mean for brains if um, position one is rejected? Yeah, so in either position one or position two, you could believe in determinism, which means that we don't have libertarian free will. Do you still have to say it's something more than a Turing machine oh, or something? I'm saying, I'm saying that, the, that uh, at least in my view, the, the brain is a machine. And you can treat that machine as if it's computer, but that would only be by ascription, not description. Right? That would, so, so what I'm saying is that what constitutes a computer is simply the things that we treat as being computers. And so when we care about consciousness, we don't care about, oh, that thing is just acting intelligently, or we just think of it as if it is intelligent. We want to know, is it actually conscious and intelligent, and those sorts of things, right? And so, um, so yeah, like I... I um, like I said, like you, you don't have to have a side either way in terms of the free will mm -hmm. determinism debate about it, but um, um, but you can think of the the body as very mechanical, right? And uh, but mechanical doesn't mean that it's computational. As as I said earlier in the presentation, all computers are machines, but not all machines are computers. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh no. Go, you go ahead because you haven't spoken. <laughs> I was just gonna ask if we were able to come up with a scientific definition for consciousness. Do you think then? Have computers emulate consciousness 
in a way that wasn't simulative? Yeah, great question. I think that the arguments here are trying to be logical arguments, not empirical arguments. So that means that no matter how far into the future computers um, evolve, uh, well not evolve, but like progress, if there's still a computer as defined by the, the formal definition of what computation is, they can never be conscious. If we did have a scientific definition of consciousness, what I think would happen is, we, is all the people that think that we can create consciousness on computers would say, oh, I was totally wrong. Now I understand how consciousness works. I'm going to stop working on these computer programming and I'm going to start actually building a machine that could be conscious. So, so that distinction between machines and computers I think is really key. Uh, if we had a scientific definition of consciousness, my assumption is that we would then be able to create a conscious machine. But computers are just not enough of a machine to get us there. Mm -hmm. We'd have to do something beyond computers. Yeah. Yes? So my question is, I noticed that free will is nowhere in your definition of consciousness. Um, is that is that your view that, that consciousness does not involve free will, or do you, where do you see that fitting in? I'm, that I'm more sympathetic to, to the concept of, of libertarian free will, but I think that there's really, really good arguments on both sides, and I don't know that I'm qualified to give a really good like assessment either way. That's just my own personal personal view, but it's but it, but I guess what I'm trying to present is that you can b you can come down either way on that argument but these arguments uh, against computers you know developing consciousness still hold so i'm trying to really focus it on that and um um you know if someone could convince me one way or the other you know i'd say okay but that wouldn't affect anything that i've really shared but yeah yes it's interesting i take it that the so I think this is part of how we tell our stories about robots that we're trying to figure out whether or not they're persons often, mm -hmm. is people get up, become really concerned with whether they can act outside of their program, right? break some rule or something. Um, and, and I think the reason we're interested in that is that then implies to us that's because they're a person. There's some thing that exists independent of this set of rules. Um, and of course, that's a very complicated question when you start saying, well, wait a minute, do we have any reason to think that humans are persons in that sense, independent of a set of causes? Um, and one of the complexities of the free will debate, and, you know, cue me in here, but is that there's something a little bit nonsensical in trying to say, I act best from myself if my actions are uncaused by any set of rules, including maybe we could conceive of a set of rules that happens to be identical with who I am. Like, who am I other than my set of dispositions that psychologically function as rules? So the idea that to have free will, I need to act in an uncaused way, which seems to be implied when we ask a computer to prove its personhood by acting against rules, is, is a bit confused, actually, I think. Um, yeah. So, I know we're almost out of time, but in general, one of my responses to this whole conversation, I guess is a question of, so what if it turns out, so what is consciousness and where does it come from, which we know we don't know. <laughs> but, um, but one thing that's speculated, given the constant conjunction in our experience of brains certain kinds of, and, and our assumption by analogy that other people have consciousness and either that other creatures who have different physical realization of brains have consciousness. Um, one theory that emerges is emergentism, right? Is, is some suspicion that we achieve some level of functional complexity and conscious phenomenal experience somehow comes into being as a result. Um, and every time I do Cyril and kind of look at this discussion, I find the discussion really convincing when we're applying this narrow understanding of, of a computer. But as soon as we introduce complications, say a proposal of something like an emergentism, um, where we say, yes, there's a narrow way of understanding the computer, but if we think that functional, a physical functional realization has the potential to then have an emergent consciousness, that the, the there's a mechanism for that. Um, then suddenly this argument looks like it's treating computers too narrowly. And I take it that that's often the concern, say, in sci-fi, right? Is that 
Um, and I'm just reading Frankenstein for the first time right now, so we're taking it like old school sci-fi where it's sci-fi, we're not building it out of metal, we're building it out of organic material, but it's still based on this principle that if I understand the mechanics correctly, mm -hmm. um, consciousness emerges. And that certainly is Mary Shelley's thesis, right? It's yeah. that person that emerges from a mechanical, an artificial, a, um, I'm not finding it. You made the distinction between them, two kinds of natural, right? Like so our artificial it's like the artificial yeah. diamond. So Frankenstein is an artificial diamond. It's mm -hmm. not a, um, but it's still a diamond. Right. right. Anyway, so those are my <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Probably similar to last year. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yes. Sorry, we out of time, but I am just curious. So um, with the traditional um, I guess method of computation, it's usually using the Turing machine, right? And using the syntax of um, using the binary syntax, right? At zero one. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like um, maybe that's probably why um, we're not able to produce consciousness? Because the brain or like a person who has consciousness doesn't think in a binary way, like true or false type thing. And so like maybe, maybe, or some middle ground or like maybe more dimension than just yes or no, right? Is that so are you asking if, if we're limited you, because of the, the symbols that we're using? It was yes, only one you, and zero? You, yeah, do you feel like if maybe we introduce like more symbols um, as a syntax um, that, that we, we might be closer to the way that, because in my mind I'm like, okay, I'm not sure if conscious beings think that way, like a binary way, like yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that? Yeah, so it's really agnostic to the symbols, and there's nothing you can do with more symbols that you can't do with just two. That's the power of computation, and mm -hmm. what's called, uh, well, that's, that's, that's really the power of computation, is that okay. adding more symbols doesn't actually that's help you. Okay. Now, there is a case in which I have, we can talk about here, called about quantum computers, where they do add a third kind of state, which is called a superposition. Um, and it doesn't actually help you perform any type of computation. What it does is it helps you perform some types of computations faster.